When we look at the VFSS exam in children, these exams are used to make critical decisions for medically fragile children. Despite procedural variabilities, we question which contrast should we use, how many, what position do we use for the child who's being exam examined, and imaging, what is the frame acquisition rate and the magnification. How many exams? How long should each exam be? We have multiple sources of variability that are related to procedure. We also do not agree upon definitions. We don't have standard definitions for physiologic parameters. We don't have metrics for interpreting and reporting results. We don't have the metrics that are needed for the development of meaningful outcome measures. And we don't have criteria for when to repeat exams. Let's consider what some of the potential sources of unnecessary variability can be. One is the ex skills of the examining clinician. We know that more frequent recommendations are made for instrumental exams by less versus more experienced clinicians. We know that there are longer fluoroscopy times, which is associated with higher levels of radiation exposure when the clinicians are novice versus trained. In addition, when physiologic information is not available, intervention decisions are primarily based on findings of bolus flow, for example, aspiration or penetration alone. However, when physiologic information is available, variability in interventions across clinicians decreases. It's very important for Maureen and I to relay to clinicians that we didn't just make these components up. Uh, they were rigorously tested. And we also didn't just take what's currently on the MBS IMP and directly apply it to bottle-fed children. So we started off with um, expert consensus in terms of these components, and then we checked them, tested them, field tested them for reliability and validity with speech-language pathologists. So it's important that we relay to you what our scientific premise was for even doing this project. We recognize, certainly, that there are differences in the anatomical configuration of the upper aerodigestive tract between adults and bottom-fed children. There's differences in, certainly, the, the children have sucking and feeding dynamics that are very different from adults. And the clinical circumstances that surround the swallowing problem in a bottle-fed child versus adult are very different. It was very important to me when I was doing and continue to refine and do the work with adults that we go well beyond just documenting aspiration and residue because we have plenty of evidence now that demonstrates that we can identify the cause of residue in the oral cavity and pharynx and the cause of airway invasion using this standardized approach. So when we developed this tool for bottle-fed children, it was very important to us as well that we go well beyond just identifying these two outcomes of impaired physiology and determine the nature and severity of the swallowing impairment. An example of the importance of identifying the nature and severity of the problem are these two examples of a baby being bottle fed. They're two different patients. Both would present with a score of eight on the penetration aspiration scale if one was using that scale, which means the contrast material um, being extracted from the nipple is entering the airway below the level of the vocal folds, and the child is seemingly not making any effort to expel the material, at least based on our observation. Further, both of them would have a molecular residue uh, presence, so you see it in both children, and you also see piriform residue in both children. So if the only result that came back from this swallow study was that the, the child had residue and aspiration. 
it doesn't really give us information as to how to manage these two outcomes or risks, if you will, of an underlying physiologic swallowing problem. If we detailed using our scale, our baby VFSS, on these two children, you can see very different scores, very different underlying physiologic mechanisms causing the residue and the aspiration. On the baby on your left, this baby has very prompt initiation of nutritive suck. Baby on the right is delayed. Baby on the left is four sucks per swallow, where baby on the right is two. On the baby on your left, there is cohesive bolus contained in the oral cavity, where baby on the right has diffuse bolus contained in the oral cavity and that it's spreading around. Baby uh, on the left has um, a delayed initiation of pharyngeal swallow that's greater than two seconds. Baby on the right has less than or equal to two seconds. Baby on the left has a trace column of contrast in the laryngeal vestibule at the height of the swallow. Baby on the right has a narrow or essentially wider column of contrast in the vestibule. Baby on the left is aspirating during the swallow. Baby on the right is aspirating after the swallow. Pharyngoesophageal segment opening is partially distended with partial duration in baby on the left, and in baby on the right, there's complete distension duration of the PE segment.